and I'm sure you've all uh, been with him in DR. And so, Miss Mills, so uh, I'm not going to pluck any uh, kidneys out of vaginas, I tell you that. <laughs> 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 stuff. Went straight to the other end of the body when I saw what that was about <laughs> early on. <laughs> okay, um, well, I'm very flattered you should ask me. Uh, and it's very nice to see you, and it's very encouraging that people are so enthusiastic about surgery. Because every time I ask someone in the DR what they're going to be, they usually say general practitioner. To actually find us a few surgeons and interest is really very cheering, because uh, I am hopelessly biased. Now, what I thought I'd do is, and I will use my own discipline, of course, uh, to draw examples, is it gave me a chance to think about the way I actually thought uh, when I was a practicing surgeon. So this is actually the thinking of this surgeon. It wouldn't necessarily be others. But I hope it have some principles that you've already probably twigged. But I have a feeling they only came to me after I'd been actually doing surgery for about 10 or 15 years, that I had a, a definite sort of idea about what I was meant to be doing or the way I approached things. So they are, these are principles and examples that I think help me get through it, to be blunt, because it has its ups and downs, but it is very rewarding indeed. Now, you have called it <coughs> memoirs, alternatively, of a battle-scarred veteran. It could be music with an old fart if you wanted as an alternative. <laughs> Who's these two? Do you know who they are? Anyone know their names? No one knows these off the Muppet Show. Oh, the culturally deprived, <laughs> I have to say. Oh, well, that's Mr. Waldorf, and that's Mr. Stettler. And during the uh, uh, Muppet Show, their role was to... Have you seen the Muppet Show? Oh, yeah. good, good. They used to sit up in the balcony. And every now and then, this one would say, Rubbish, rubbish, rubbish. And I suspect it might be a bit of that from me. So this was just to control any aspirations to sort of seriousness I might occasionally have. Now, here is a serious note, uh, because, and anyone who knows what te morituri salutamus means, has had a serious education. We'll move on. Now, I put that up. You all know that. That is the correct Latin, primo non nocere, and it is actually uh, said to have been said by Hippocrates, but it was Galen who actually published that effect, and I forget when, and it's the golden rule of any practice of medicine, whether it's surgical <coughs> or physicianly, and it is first do no harm. Uh, and I think that is something you have to think very much about as a surgeon, because your intervention is very immediate and sometimes very sudden, and you've got to think about this. Physicians have time to work out whether they're treatment, their drug treatment or whatever, is going to give uh, um, a possibility of harm and then work out a strategy. You've got to do the same thing, but you've got to work out a strategy fast, especially if something goes wrong. So it's in your mind naturally. First, do no harm. Now here's the second golden rule of surgery. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I have to say there are many surgeons who get through their careers without really taking that on board. <coughs> this is perhaps the most difficult decision you have when something's not going quite right and you have to weigh up whether your surgical intervention is actually going to make it go right. But the best rule is if it ain't broke and everyone's all right, just leave it, okay? Um, there is a tendency among surgeons to feel they have to come up with an operation for almost any, condi any condition or situation and that's a, a false way of thinking. You don't have to do that. Many of the best decisions you can make is to decide not to operate. So when to operate is actually a very, very difficult decision and perhaps the most important you make. Now, my view of it is this. Uh, the basic principle here is the body's got a very good equipment, really, designed to fix itself, to help it heal, if you want. And as a surgeon, you must always bear that in mind and you must use that. You mustn't thwart what the body's doing. You should have it, or rather, you should be on the body's side. 
uh, the repair mechanisms are going to be your most useful adjunct. Well, he doesn't care for prosthetic devices put in. They'd much rather have one of their own tissues, if I might put it that way, to which they're used. <coughs> and how they do this operation, in what way is the body going to help the goal or aim that I wish to achieve? So I think that's, that's an important thought. Now, this is uh, a connection uh, with one of the legends of surgery, Pasty Barrett. Pasty because of his complexion, and it was. And he's the last of the great <coughs> dinosaurs. And he taught me, as a medical student, uh, in my first year, no, my third year, when I first started clinical. At that time, he was 80, so he's the last of the dinosaurs. So this is your link now with those dinosaurs. And you can see where I am on the evolutionary tree compared to you, basically. And I remember, he, first of all, I'm sure, I, what worries me about this is I'm going to keep giving little anecdotes that I've told you all in the DR over and over again. <laughs> If that's the case, just, just you know, think, well, oh, it's getting on a bit. It's only charitable, anyway. I remember this chap. Now, the thing about him was, first of all, he never recognized the presence of female medical students. He insisted on calling them nurse. <laughs> if, you, if you want to know how a female medical student felt about that, talk to my wife. She'll <coughs> grit her teeth. <laughs> but she knew him for what he was. Now, I remember him taking us on to the ward, and I was uh, a clinical student at St. Thomas's, which is Florence Nightingale's hospital. And Florence Nightingale, and I should have put a picture in, designed what she saw as the ideal ward. And the Nightingale ward is a huge ward, and usually there are about 16 to 20 beds. Landock's got a bit of it left. 16 to 20 beds down one side, 16 to 20 down the other. And the advantage of this was that the ward sister could see exactly what was going on along the whole length of the place. The downside was, of course, the privacy, perhaps, but that was the way she ran it. And I remember going on to a ward, and for some reason, pretty unusual, there were no nurses inside, none. And Pasty Barrett had a look around, and there were rows of people with drips up and legs and plasters <coughs> and people being stretched and God knows what. And he said, look around you boys, put it down there, look around you boys, observe the remarkable power of the human body to heal itself if left entirely to its own devices. <laughs> and actually, that's a variant on if it ain't broke, don't fix it, because all the time you're likely to get there. He, he was, a, the, the consultants in that age were, in a way, well, they were, they, they were, they were gods, and, they, and this is the reason for a lot of the changes we see, they behaved somewhat erratically and rather bombastically. Basically, Barrett had a, a dachshund, you know a dachshund, a sausage dog? <laughs> and... Uh, Unfortunately, mind you, you're asking for it if you're a sausage dog. Someone rode over it on a bicycle. That's <laughs> <laughs> fair length. You bound to come under if you're Jackson sometime to a, a bicycle. What did it do? Ruptured its diaphragm. Now, ba Pasty Barrett realised that instantly. <coughs> so he, I don't know if he did mouth to mouth with this red creature. <laughs> anyway, what does he do? He gets on the phone to one of the anaesthetists and said, see you in the operating theatre in 20 minutes. <laughs> they take this dachshund to the operating theatre, the senior anaesthetist anaesthetizes it, and he repairs the diaphragm in the hospital operating <laughs> Now, I don't think I could do that now. <laughs> I think that, yeah, I wouldn't. I'd have gone, you know, I'd have gone by now if I'd done that. Anyway, sorry about Pasty Barrett, but of course, you probably know of him. You know what Barrett's esophagus is. This is the Barrett. So quite apart from all that papering, he did do some quite serious work in one way or another.